the power of peer support is increasing, increasingly important for everyone in outpatient mental health clinics. And we're so lucky to have three of New York's leading peer innovators as they share a backdrop of the growing sophistication and emerging evidence for the effectiveness of peer-run service innovations. They're going to discuss, among other things, the issues that may arise with implementation and share in the positive outcomes of true service transformation. You're going to first hear from Harvey Rosenthal from Nyapris, then Helen Helion from Hands Across Long Island, and then Steve Michio from People, Inc. Um, we will have a few minutes at the end of the webinar for questions, but please chat them to me in the chat box. Uh, you can send them to all panelists, and I'll collect those, and at the end we, we will uh, have a question and answer about a few minutes for that. Um, we're going to get started, and thank you again to all of you for joining us today. Harvey, would you like to begin? Yeah, are you going to pass me the ball? Great. I am going to pass you the ball. Okie dokie. Well, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. I'm Harvey Rosenthal, and uh, I have uh, 43 years in recovery, and I have um, worked in the field for 17 years, going back to the 70s, both working in inpatient and in clinic and in re rehabilitation, and then have been the exec director of NIAPRS for the last 20-odd years, and they have been odd, um, and so have really uh, worked to, with, with NIAPRS to promote the recovery, rehabilitation rights, cultural competence, and community integration of people with psychiatric disabilities through a variety of strategies like advocacy, training and TA, peer service innovations, employment, economic self-sufficiency initiatives, things like that. Uh, so I'm going to open up my presentation by just with some, some definitions of, of a peer. Uh, you know, this is a really important topic, and it's important because peers can play a really critical role here. Uh, but from our point of view, there needs to be a real understanding and an integrity for how peers are positioned and supervised and what they do. And it's important to start even with, with an understanding of the definition. So a peer is a person with a lived experience of recovery who wishes to provide support or service to others. And peer support is the process of giving and receiving encouragement and assistance to achieve long-term recovery, which points out the, the mutuality and the lack of hierarchy. There's a real shared sort of uh, experience here. Peers offer emotional support, share knowledge, teach skills, provide practical assistance, and connect people with resources, opportunities, communities of support, and with other people. Now, peer support services, and it's ironic we're talking about a clinic program, but peer support services are defined um, as non-clinical and recovery focused. So the peers are not uh, traditionally offering professional services, assessments, expert opinions, and there's not, as I said before, the power differential. Here's a, um, a nice uh, slide from Brass Tax, this national project that a number of us are working on that really sort of uh, draws from a lot of the literature about what peer support is and what it's not. And, um, and you see right there that a peer, I'll just go down the peer column, shares lived experience, is a role model, not an authority, sees the person as a whole person in the context of their roles, family, community, now, the clinical side is a little stark and negative, so that's not the case of all clinicians, but historically it was more looking at people uh, as a case or a diagnosis and as a person with an illness uh, who needed treatment and, uh, and was, where the focus was on symptoms. Uh, peers motivate through hope and inspiration. Uh, again, I'm not going to read all these other ones on the other side. Uh, is an advocate for a person in recovery, both within the program and outside, focuses on teaching uh, by example and by information around how to accomplish daily tasks and acquire needed resources and find the basic necessities, help uh, peers to connect to important people like lawyers, doctors, psychologists, financial advisors, share knowledge of local resources, lots of encouragement, support, acknowledgement, a lot of focus on goal setting, but a goal setting according to what a person themselves is setting. Uh, for themselves, um, and again, the peer provides a role model for positive recovery behaviors and provides peer support, peer support services. There's another chart by Peggy Swarbrick. You may know her from uh, 
what a, you know, a real uh, national expert in peer support, in wellness coaching, employment, a whole, whole other bunch of areas. And again, the focus here is on uh, for a peer and a peer wellness coach is multidimensional, um, physical, mental, emotional, intellectual, financial, occupational, social, environmental, mental, and spiritual dimensions. Um, and the real purpose, again, is to start where the person is. And I, can't, I really can't say that enough because that's going to be one of the challenges of a peer in a clinical setting is they really start with, with the peer. And so there may be an interest and even an, an understandable interest from the point of the clinic or the staff to focus on medication, for example, or um, showing up at clinical appointments. But that's not where we start. It may be where we wind up. But it's, we start with where the person is. And but very often, as you know, people don't start by saying, I want a diagnosis and I want medicine. They start by saying, I want housing or friends or, um, you know, I need order in my life or, or something of that nature. I'm giving you a whole list of competencies that peers can play in, in, se in, in treatment settings and in healthcare settings and recovery settings. All of these roles, and I'm going to end with some uh, some thoughts about how they can be financed, because I think that's a key issue. And the New York State's Medicaid behavioral health care reform is moving in a direction where there will there appears to be flexible funding to um, to deliver this kind of service and not be quite as tied to the current Medicaid requirements and restrictions. So. Peers are skilled at doing outreach and engagement, which are often the keys to the success. Some of these are taken from health home, and clinics are going to be in health homes and members of health homes, so I think it's, it's, it applies. And I'm using the term here, here peer wellness coach, but it's, the roles will be renamed and changed depending on what they actually do in the environment and maybe the reimbursement stream. But the term I'm going to use probably throughout here is coaches. Uh, so here, in this case, the co you know a coach is really uh, uniquely skilled and effective in starting the process of outreach and engagement. You know, we're heading into an environment where we're recognizing lots of people don't show up for service uh, for any number of, of reasons, and not not because they're non-compliant, but because their lives are in in disarray, or they're reluctant about service, or they don't have the money or the means to get to to services, or they experience it as stigmatizing, or they've had bad experiences with treatment, or they think the focus is, is too much on the illness, or things like that. So the ability to to start with people and get and start with that opening relationship that is hopeful and positive and empathetic, and in many cases persistent, because lots of people need you to come to them and need to, need you to come in a persistent fashion. But again, it's how you do it. Uh, and I'm just going to keep sort of beating on this topic. It's, I heard once somebody say, peers are cheap staff that get people to take their medicine. And, you know, we shrink at things like that. Well, hopefully they're not cheap. Uh, and more importantly, we start with where people are. So we don't start by getting people to go to a clinic or take their medicine. We, we will be an ally to the clinical and recovery aims of the clinic, for example, or the program. But anyway, our unique sort of skill is in persistence and passion and empathy and hope and trust, and again, starting where, where people are. Uh, but that, those kind of engagements really last, I think, and, and as opposed to many people falling out of care because they don't feel like they have hope or a relationship or someone to explain in more personal terms. And the second slide about really coming to people. Lots of people don't show up for any number of reasons. Uh, and they need folks to come to them. Um, and that's one of the great values of peers and peer wellness coaches, is the ability to feed on the street to go to people and provide, you know, start that relationship where the person is and provide information, assistance, and support, and to uh, really try to match up uh, help with what the person is asking for. Uh, certainly a big part of our service system is focused now on person-centered care and, where possible, person-directed care. Uh, and so that really uh, implies more than just getting a peer to agree to a service plan that we think is best. I'm sure you know that. Uh, but the you know wellness coaches and peer staff can really, again, translate what a person really wants and needs and what they identify as their patterns of strength or of relapse 
into a good service plan. And we have these tools called wellness recovery action plans that are often best uh, sort of completed between a peer uh, who's getting served and a peer who's working in support of them. And a lot of the times you can take that information in the wellness recovery action plan and put some of it in an advanced directive, which is that legal document which will indicate what, what help a person needs, what they'll respond to, what they'll want at a time when perhaps they can't really say. And again, we're moving into an era of electronic healthcare records where hopefully the advanced directive will be uh, very uh, prominent, uh, much more than it is now. Uh, in terms of just a quick sort of data about uh, when people are feeling, there is research that's come out recently to show that people who feel empowered and are more involved in their self-advocacy and are being may taking, making more choices that are, have fewer symptoms and are more willing to engage in services. Um, a big piece now you're hearing a lot about health literacy and self-management, especially in this healthcare Medicaid redesign world, recognizing that people need a lot of information. They don't often understand um, what the you know what the what the medical problem is, for example, what the course of care is, what are the symptoms and signs of both uh, illness and recovery. Uh, people need health literacy sort of coaching, and wellness coaches, particularly by their by their name and their training, are skilled in teaching people about wellness and supporting them into lifestyle changes. And we have tools like the Eight Dimensions of Wellness that you see here by Peggy Swarbrick. And as you may know, Larry Fricks has a program now that the National Council uh, is making available called Whole Health Action Management, or WAM, which is a uh, eight-week a group-focused program run by peers for peers that teach resiliency, wellness, and self-management, and a really good fit for a peer-delivered approach to raising health literacy and self-management, uh, and with a real focus on the things that we know. We have people who have so many issues with blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol, lung, kidney, liver issues. I don't have to tell you that uh, we can't do enough in the area of wellness. Uh, there's also peers can really advocate, inform, and help transform the system in which they're with. There are many increasing instances where environments really benefit, added value by having a peer in a room while people are doing service planning, trying to unpack what's happening, trying to understand what approach will work, trying to translate what's going on. And I, we had peers working in the precursor of the uh, health home, the chronic illness demonstration program that Optum Health ran, and our peers were in what they call treatment rounds and were just seen as invaluable and really informative and helped really reframe what was going on in a way that worked for everybody. Uh, there's a lot of talk in this environment about the social determinants of health, recognizing, and I think that even the Medicaid department here in New York is really seeing that these are valuable, really critical elements to helping people get well, so it's not just about doctors and pills and symptom management, but also you know, really looking at, and again, many of you do this now, income, housing, stress, early childhood experiences, social exclusion, uh, work, uh, ed, you know, economic sort of status, housing status, education level, sanitation, social access, discrimination, racism, domestic violence, just really, and peers are you know, very often able to get that information and focus I help I help focus on that. Uh, a big piece is, and Steve will talk more about this, uh, relapse prevention and crisis management support. So peers or wellness coaches or wherever the peer peers are deployed or, or have a good experience in once they have the trust and the understanding and there's a, a wellness recovery action plan that lays out warning signs and red flags and strategies. Uh, the peers can be really helpful at that. And because there's such a focus now on trying to uh, uh, prevent avoidable ER and inpatient uh, visits and admissions, uh, it's a critical function for to, to be a first, uh, a first responder when a person is in trouble or a last resort as an alternative to going to the emergency room or the hospital. Uh, we're moving into an era of electronic technology. And so uh, whether it's... Um, you know, making, you know, the electronic health care record where peers hopefully with help from their coaches will know about what's in their records, sometimes inform what's in their records, use peer crisis warm lines, telephone lines to reach out. 
um, yeah, peer crisis respite uh, services, which Steve will talk about. And increasingly, there are websites and applications on smartphones and other devices that really help people track their health and remind them and give them 12-step messages and, uh, and information about health and wellness and recovery. And peers can be a real asset in helping people to use those. Uh, we're moving into an era, and I'll talk about this a little bit in a second before I finish. In New York, we're talking now about um, flexing Medicaid and in the health and recovery plans that we're talking about, which represent integrated health, mental health, and medical services in uh, these new designs, the state is really talking about what they call 1959 services, which are more flexible, recovery-oriented services that previously were not Medicaid reimbursable, but should be if everything goes the way it's planned here in New York. One of those things that Medicaid will be able to pay for is individualized budgets, which is taking money that ordinarily is spent through programs and providers and put in the hands of consumers to spend according to their service self-identified needs, their service plans that meet the standards and are, you know, are well managed, are tightly approved. But peers are, we're already seeing the results in Texas and Pennsylvania of how people are buying common sense really uh, concrete things like um, clothing, uh, job, a resume rewrite, internet connection, repairing a car to help, you know, the practical things that help people take those valued roles. And sometimes there are a few expenses, flexible dollars away, being able to do that alternative treatment, health club membership, what have you. And there are, there's increasing data coming out of some of these. Speaking of data, you'll see and there's, peer services are really now generating some real credible data. Uh, Steve at Rose House has data in, internal to his program. Uh, where in 2010, 90% of the people that had been to his crisis risk program did not return for two years there, thereafter to the hospital. Niapras has that data both in peer bridging out of state hospitals, 72% drop in readmissions, and more recently in Optum Health peer bridging, we're doing downstate 50% drop in people rehospitalized, and uh, when they are, 50% drop in, in, in the length of stay. You see other data around Optum Health taking peer bridging into other states. Um, some of that data, I think, has got to be updated on Wisconsin, Tennessee. It's much higher in both cases than that. I think Tennessee's in the 70s, Wisconsin in the 90s. In Western New York, we have two programs, Mental Health Peer Connection, that's helping 53% of individuals to get back to work once they identify that. We used to talk people out of out of employment, and or and our record is not that good, 15% employment rate. So very extraordinary. And again, employment is a real pathway to recovery and a real indication of what it uh, very closely associated with decreased readmissions and things like that, relapses. And we have a housing program, Housing Options Made Easy, that helps 70% of the people to stay out of hospital thereafter. Um, so here's that option I was mentioning. I'm going to close quickly here. And look at the flexibility of the services, crisis respite uh, at the bottom, education, employment, um, Peer support, these are things that Medicaid currently doesn't support, but may very well soon in this new integrated design. And uh, the outcomes are, are going to be changing. They're not just around the heat outcomes of are you taking your medicine and did you get to the clinic when after you were discharged, but are you working? And these come from the state. Uh, they're not just my dream, which they have been, but they come from the state now. They've been wired into the design. What's your housing status? What's your employment status and your economic status? How long are you able to stay in the community? Uh, how's your, you know, have we, have services been able to help you divert or re-enter from criminal justice involvement? Uh, peer services are actually an outcome meaning that's a goal of services is to connect people to peer supports. Not only are they an outcome, oh, okay. I, I, but they're part of the benefit package as well. So I'm going to stop here. I know I've gone over my time, and uh, here's Ellen Helian. Hi. And I'm going to pass the ball. I'm going to pass the ball to you, Ellen, if I can just do that. Okay. There you go. Okay. Thank you very much, Harvey. Um, I'm Ellen Helian. I'm the executive director of Hands Across Long Island, a peer-run organization for over 25 years, um, and I have been with the agency for 23 years. Um, 
what we're going to talk about today is how peers even wound up in the clinic as, as employees. Um, you know, brief his, history of Hallie. In the beginning, we were, you know, really providing uh, self-help groups to 13 uh, state-run clinics across the county. Uh, we were helping identify people's needs to survive in the community. Um, we then opened a drop-in center on Saturdays in 1989, and this is when uh, staff employees and things like that and medical model staff had a real issue with that. You know, you're going to let the patients run the, the drop-in? You know, we're very concerned. Um, and that became actually very successful even way back when. We were able to open a, an alternative housing project on the grounds of Kings Park Psychiatric Center on the, uh, these would, would be the old uh, staff housing that we used for that. And that we provided housing to over 300 people in the five years that we were there. And that offered them an opportunity to kind of settle in, have support from their peers, and even meet uh, folks that they became friends and they were able to move forward into an apartment together. So uh, that provided great support for people. We also started running a drop-in center on Sundays so that people that were inpatient could have uh, relationship with us prior them, to them getting out so that they knew where to go for support. Um, we were first uh, state grant for ha our first state, our first grant was for state housing um, and we started supported housing back then. Um, we are now in our own home owned building. We are, our services include jail diversion, prison programs and jail, in jail programs. We actually opened the first peer-run mental health clinic in the United States and now have a second. Uh, we, have a, we had a re-entry housing plot, which we're trying to get the feds to refund. That was about 80% um, of the people in the program reduced the recidivism rate. So it was uh, actually the recidivism rate prior to our being involved in the Sing Sing project was 85%. So 85 out of 100 people that were, were released from the prison were back in the prison within a year. Uh, after we had been involved for about two years, the recidivism rate totally had an inversion and was 15%. Uh, of the folks we worked with went back into prison. So that's a market improvement and certainly a proven model. Uh, and then we, we extended the housing. We now have over 150 housing slots uh, through Nassau and Suffolk County. Um, again, I mentioned before we opened the second clinic. Um, you know, just an idea that, that people who are in recovery work everywhere. We in our clinic have social workers and RNs and docs and whatever that have had their own history. So, you know, we have to really look at people who, who have a lived experience can also be a professional as well as, you know, not, not calling a peer specialist a professional. So it's something that you have to be open to both um, roles here. So the peers have been developing their role in the mental health field for years. The, the staff, uh, it was very difficult for the staff to allow a consumer to do the things that are mentioned here, they run a group, drive a van, work, you know, they allowed them to work in the clerical department or the kitchen or the maintenance crew, but had a real difficulty, you know, with giving any kind of, uh, if you will, power or authority or whatever. So. Um, today, peers continue to prove and demonstrate their capability. You know, their skills, their professionalism, and their ability to serve those individuals who share their journey of recovery. But how, how do they get that done is the question, and where it begins for an agency to incorporate peers into their agency and providing really critical services like Harvey was describing earlier. It has to start at the top. There has to be a vision at the top that coaches people to 
come on to the other side, you know, that that uh, supports people in changing the way they operate, the way they think. Um, they need to ask questions and, and really be able to sit down with staff and answer them honestly so that when you're talking to staff about a peer coming on and how, you know, what that is about, the staff have to have an opportunity to really digest that and say, well, this is my concern. I'm concerned if they have a relapse. I'm concerned if we have – and we turn that back around and talk about, well, okay, how would it feel if one of your current coworkers had a problem? What would be different about that? So we're trying to get to see the normalcy of, of um, people, that people are people no matter what's going on in their life. So, you, you know, you really work with people about, you know, working with a person with lived experience. You know, can they, can they walk the talk? You know, can they really put into action what um, they, they're saying? So, and can they have the same relationship with a coworker that they would with a person with lived experience? Some people have a real problem with that. They, they really talk, you know, talk about, well, what if? You know, well, I don't want to say anything that's going to upset this person, or I will. I don't want to, you know, set this person off or anything else. I mean, we should be well beyond that at this point. And and the reality is, is that anyone who is offering a job or employment to people, if someone comes in for the job, they come in. They're being. They should be being judged on the ability to do the job. The fact that they have a lived experience is secondary, and it has to be secondary. So, you know, but you have to work these these questions out. If you want success, you can't just plop a peer in. You really have to devote some adjustment time and some transition time to your staff and helping them make that shift. So, you know, these are some more questions that they have. What about letting them read other people's files? What about team meetings? Should should they be in team meetings or clinical meetings where we're talking about somebody they might know and, you know, all those kind of things? What about um, confidentiality? What happens if, uh, you know, the peers decompensate? What kind of roles are we talking about? Are we talking about just them filing or, you know, serving coffee and, you know, those types of things? Um, what about the liability? What about billing for their services? Where do we get the money to pay for them? What role will they take on? These are all questions that have to be thought out because you have to respect your staff enough to give them an opportunity to shift. Um, as we're looking now, for example, the two clinics that we run that are peer run, that the majority of the staff in the clinics are peers as well, they, we bill for their hours, we, and there is room within the pros to hire CPRPs, which, which are not um, licensed, but they are credentialed, so uh, Medicaid pays a, for a portion of that. So there is some movement and some identification that this can actually work. But again, from the top, there has to be this very clear message that the people at the top believe that people can recover. They believe that people in recovery can work with other workers in the mental health system side by side. They they have to people in charge, the, the top of the agency has to be the cheerleader and the supporter and the model for their staff to make this adjustment. The um to identify what is needed from a clinical team. You know, it's not just credentials. It's a it's not just being a peer. It's the ability to express the personal experience in the amounts that's appropriate. It's it's really a balance that um, supervisors have um, to help the, the peer staff to balance, you know, well, even the, even the non-peer staff have to balance. Look, you're talking to somebody who has alcohol or drug addiction, you know, and you're talking about you had that too. How much of your personal interest in personal experience gets gets um, shared there, um, that it doesn't become about that person. Um, again, Harvey talked about this, you know, empathy, not sympathy. 
um, cheer people on to be the best they can be. Collaboration in the in the clinical setting is the absolute. You know, we um, uh, for an example, when we were looking for a doc for our clinic, we we had about probably 30 docs that got up in the middle of the of the interview and said, you people are crazy, I'm out of here. So we agreed with that. We said, okay, no problem, you know, until we found the right person. But even then, we needed to talk about, you know, people need to, to be able to collaborate. That means at a clinic team meeting, everybody is at that meeting. So the peers are at that meeting because the peers have a different sense of the people they're working with as well that pull in information into the, the clinical team that give them a holistic view of the person, not just a clinical diagnosis of the person. Um, again, it's, it's what, the, what is the team needs from the administration. They need, they need to have trustworthy supervision of the clinical staff. They need guidance to stay true to the agency mission. They need support for their own growth and development. Um, they, they need the administration to reflect behavior that's expected toward the participants. We, we need the administration to lead by example. And then there needs to be patience in the development of a real, solid, recovery-oriented staff and team. And that is not going to happen the first time out. You're going to have people that come in, fall on their faces, or just have a real hard time with certain issues that we have to then refill the position and train again. And we do that until it's like creating a recipe. You know, you keep adding, subtracting, adding, subtracting until you get the perfect cake. So, um, you know, and the, and the bottom line is that people have to be able to buy into the agency mission. So, um, and that, again, that takes takes time. You need to really, uh, when you're talking about in, incorporating peers and everything else, you need to prepare to listen a lot, you know, and attend all the clinical meetings so that you can be assured that the mission is carrying out, that people don't become co-opted. Um, remind folks that we are creating a new program so that it won't be perfect. And, and by the way, it won't be perfect ever <laughs> So because we live on life's terms and life is messy sometimes. So we always are going to be having to work out the kinks. And I think anybody who's in involved in an administrative role or a supervisory role understands, even on a on – a, one-to-one -one role or, or a direct service person knows that you're constantly working out the kinks. And what we need to teach as administrators, as supervisors, is to teach the respect, the mutuality, the trust, and the kindness amidst all this controversy. So, um, again, the proof is in the pudding. You know, the outcomes we've had over the last two years have been 78% reduction in hospitalization or crisis. Um, that includes calling the police or calling an ambulance. 36% of our participants went to school or are working. Um, and 29% of participants are reducing public benefits because of their employment. So it is working, and it does work. And it's about, we keep always going back to, it's about the relationship. It's about our employees, no matter what their role, are employees able to meet the person where they are and journey with them through their recovery? So the outcomes really are a result of a phenomenal team um, that took probably four years to really get to. Um, but we melded this team of professionals from all walks of life, from all kinds of worlds, um, from rehabilitation to clinical to licensed and unlicensed professionals, certified and uncertified, all of which 84% or more are people with lived experience. So um, it's always a great day at Halley. 
it's always a new day, actually. So there is our information on both of our programs. And um, you'll see some of the pictures of our, our folks in action and our graduates who actually these four were four of 12 graduates that um, graduated from a culinary arts school that we were able to um, uh, send them to so with another grant. So it's possible, it's here, it's, you know, I, I also hate to say that it's not a cheap, uh, we don't want it to be a cheap source for, for clinics and, and agencies to use as peers. We want it to be um, what you would pay for a service to help somebody get to where they want to be. So, you know, it's about the job description, not, you know, it's not because they're a peer they get the job. They get the job because they can do the, the job. And even if two people are equally qualified, then the peer is the person who is uniquely more qualified, inherently more qualified to take the job. So that's it for me, and I am going to, I hope I've helped uh, clear some things up. But here is uh, Steve Michio, who has some really great programs that uh, he's going to share with you, and I'm going to pass the ball to Steve, and it's all yours, Steve. All right. Thanks very much. Glad to be here today. Um, just to talk about, <clears throat> People is also a uh, peer-run organization. We're serving uh, six counties here in New York, um, providing a host of uh, diversion services, peer advocacy services, peer advocate training, things like that. Um, we're doing a lot of collaboration and, and preparation for this uh, uh, Medicaid redesign in, in New York and in our area um, on really integrating services um, better so that they are more effective. Um, so just to go quickly into it, in 2005, uh, we made an agreement with the local county to put peers into the clinics in Ulster County. And the reason was it was a huge transformation effort going on at that point um, to really transform services from illness-based services to wellness-based services. They, they did embrace it after a lot of discussion, a lot of uh, uh, looking at what outcomes we were providing as a peer-run organization, uh, our relationships with other organizations and how we were um, really focused on the overall, you know, wellness and moving forward in people's lives rather than trying to maintain an illness lifestyle. And uh, it was embraced um, by the community, but it took time. Um, placing a peer in the clinic uh, also took time, and it was really focused on uh, promoting a wellness and recovery um, outlook in, in, in the traditional setting. Um, the responsibilities of the peer advocates were to provide wellness education, facilitate support groups, um, advocate at treatment team meetings, assist people in developing RAP plans, and provide session prep and crisis support. The important thing that we wanted to do was help people understand why they were coming to therapy. You know, and we, we actually uh, developed a curriculum called What is Therapy? And it's, it's a way of approaching your therapist um, with questions and, and asking about expectations and um, where are we going with this treatment, with this therapy? Um, and the advocate was really key in, in helping um, both the staff of the clinics and the people that are using the services to understand that there was a, an approach towards wellness and not just maintaining uh, visits every week. They also provide information, technical assistance on additional natural supports in the community. We're really trying to integrate people into natural social networks and natural supports in community that support wellness. Um, they uh, represented uh, peers at local meetings. Uh, we were on all the committees, or still are on all the committees in the, in the community um, that are important to wellness and recovery. Uh, represent at all local trainings and conferences. Uh, we link people to the peer services in our community. Now, we have um, uh, peer diversion uh, services as well as um, uh, a couple of houses that are uh, rose houses. I don't know if you've heard of those, but uh, they are hospital diversion houses. And they, what they do is they're designed to really prevent people from having to go to an ER or inpatient hospitalization, and they can be in crisis. and they're going to get uh, assistance on how to look at crisis differently and how to deal with crisis differently. 
on how to uh, avoid um, not only costly hospitalizations, but hospitalizations that in tradition have not worked well for a lot of folks. So the peer in the clinic was also uh, responsible to uh, make that connection and linkage. The challenges, um, as Ellen was talking about, was that stigma and fear are real. Um, they thought that the peers in the clinics would spy on the clinicians and report uh, whatever they thought they would be reported on. They were worried about the liability. They were worried about uh, information uh, being shared with a peer that may not be shared with the clinician. Um, I can assure you that the staff were trained to do the right thing. They were trained to, if there was important information, they were going to be transparent in the relationship with the peer, with the other person receiving services to say, this is important, this really needs to be discussed with the clinician, and if you want, I can also sit in that session with you and, and help you get through this. Um, there was fear that the peer would decompensate, you know, which is a term we don't like, um, but we hear it all the time, from the stress of working with people in need. Um, after uh, 14 years of working with people in crisis in our diversion services, um, we've learned what kind of characteristics uh, we need in the staff that we hire, um, what kind of training folks need, what kind of support folks need, and that also spills over into traditional services and traditional providers that they also need those kinds of supports uh, so that they don't uh, burn out from the stress and they don't decompensate themselves from the stress. And So it really is a two-way street and it's really collaboration that we have to focus on uh, within the clinic settings. Uh, there was worry around marginalizing the medical model. Um, that still comes up a lot in peer services. And um, uh, just to let you know, we are not marginalizing the medical model. Um, this is uh, actually a complement to the medical model, but also moving us towards uh, a real um, focus on, on uh, medical and then non-medical or non-traditional uh, towards wellness. Um, other challenges were the consistent communication and collaboration with clinicians on, on what might help the people served. We do annual surveys, uh, actually twice a year we do the surveys now uh, for people in the clinics, but we also have open dialogues where we talk about the services with folks that come to the clinics and really try to get from them a sense of what's helping, what's not helping. <clears throat> and the other piece of it is on the clinician side is that there has to be a lot of support and training on that end as well. Um, you can't just do a wellness training and expect everyone to get it. It's got to be constant and ongoing, and we've been doing it now for close to eight years, and we still need to do it. We have to remind each other, you know, what our mission is, what our purpose is. Um, maintaining the mission of wellness is just its just a constant reminder because it's very easy to fall back into tradition, uh, even in today's climate, with change um, of trying to, you know, maximize services and uh, not really focusing on what the outcome is or what we're trying to gain from, from those services. Um, Co-facilitating group therapy with clinicians uh, was a challenge in the beginning and now works really well because the clinicians are seeing the benefit of the relationship of the mutuality and how it builds trust among people served. Um, I think we're getting better information, more accurate information from people that we're serving, uh, and it's really um, contributing to a better clinical uh, relationship with folks. Um, peer advocates uh, practice wellness and share um, uh, that they all have RAP plans. Um, the staff here, people all do have RAP plans. Uh, they, they, um, wellness plans are so important and critical for everyone. Um, it's even gotten to the point where some of the clinicians have developed their own RAP plans uh, within the clinics and uh, discuss how a wellness plan for, for the, we, we, we often talk about how the wellness plan for clinical staff is a benefit um, as uh, stress, especially today with the, the reduction in funding and, and things that are happening in certain clinics um, is being implemented. It's real important that we address people's stress and, and keep uh, uh, clinicians as well as uh, our peers and as well as the people we're serving because you can't really focus on that if you're thinking about your own stressors, you know, at all times. Um, developing a team culture around wellness and recovery, again, this is a challenge, and it's something that we have to constantly revisit and retrain and work with each other on doing, and um, we are seeing good results from it because uh, over the years we've seen it's not just the peer delivery of wellness training now, it's also the clinics and clinicians are getting into the game of also figuring out how can we make this a more trauma-informed environment? How can we make this more of a, a healing clinic? And, and uh, it's really moving forward. 
outcome for us. Um, we developed an open door policy at all levels, which means that there is transparency in all decision making that affects the clinic, and, and our peers are involved in that. We're involved in that. Uh, we are now in the Dutchess County clinics um, doing a lot of um, not just engagement, not just uh, um, outreach and, and, and things like that. We're at the open access, and we're tying people into other services, not just clinic services, and really giving them a full complement of services that are available in the community. And it's really starting to pay off, and uh, um, it's starting to uh, really affect um, critical services because people are understanding that they don't necessarily have to wait till crisis happens to get help. They know that there are places they can go before a crisis happens, and that's something that's real important to all of this. And, and again, our work is really focused on diversion, and I think it's we're just learning so much from what we do uh, with the clinics that uh, we're getting better at uh, really creating better diversion services overall. The other thing we wanted to do is that all agencies and organizations have core values, and it's nice to see core values on a wall and how people, you know, really embrace recovery, embrace wellness, embrace hope and uh, resiliency and things like that. But what does that look like? When people walk into your clinic, you know, what does it really look like? How can people really understand that you believe in your values and you practice your values? And we do a lot of work around um, not only just creating the values, the core values, but we create the behaviors that support those values. And that's that's critical, I think, because it really um, shows the customer um, how much you care and how much you're really focused on the overall mission of the organization. Um, the medical model, like I said, was not marginalized. It was challenged, and it continues to be challenged at all times uh, at team meetings. Um, uh, people, you know, still kind of tend to live in a critical mode where they think that, oh, if somebody's having a real hard time, we need to increase meds, we need to increase hospitalization or something like that. And our focus is to let's back off, let's really talk to the person, let's see what's more involved, what goes a little deeper, how the peer relationship is, what information we're getting that we can share so that we can really focus on more of a recovery approach and, and less of the medical critical approach that, that has been the tradition. Um, and then uh, the other challenge is we're trained and, and reviewed person-centered and strength-based approaches as a team. And we're really coming from not deficit-based approaches anymore, they are strength-based approaches, and that really makes a difference when you constantly bring that up at the meetings, um, the treatment team meetings, and, and try to focus on, on moving forward. So our outcomes as a result of having a peer, and this is the, these are averages over five years um, that we took, and, and we annual wrap plans that we create are about 400 a year now, um, not just within the clinics, but also within the other services. We're also in the emergency rooms of the hospitals, we're on the units of the hospitals, um, we're not just in the clinics, but the clinic outcomes have been really uh, progressive and, and successful in that way. Um, Co-facilitating groups, 150 groups a year we hold, which are um, actually is on the increase uh, this year especially because we're really focused more on diversion services, so we're taking more of a, an approach to education on crisis diversion services. We've diverted approximately 30 people a year. Um, this is just from one of the clinics we took this number. Uh, from going to hospital or using, using crisis services or crisis housing. Um, people referred to employment services has averaged about 85 people a year, which in the past, um, when we first started this, the count was about 2 to 10 people a year being averaged uh, or referred to employment services. So we've really dramatically increased that. And then the advocacy services um, continue uh, where we've provided um, 220, you know, at least advocacy uh, services per year. And what I mean by advocacy services, it ranges from clinic advocacy to entitlement and benefits advocacy to community advocacy to overall systems advocacy. So we're learning within the clinic what's working within our community, what's not um, by what people are bringing to us as far as advocate uh, issues. Um, and we're addressing those as we go along too uh, because we do operate a recovery center in that community as well as, as, well as our um, general advocacy services. So we're we're constantly working with other providers and other systems to uh, to improve those outcomes. Um, so in conclusion, the lived experience can enhance the quality of service delivery in any traditional environment. Um, it provides a good orientation. Um, that's the other thing I would really want to mention is that if your clinic doesn't have a good orientation as to what you provide and what your expectations are and what the expectations of the customer are, um, 
you, you would really do yourself well to really look at that and provide a good orientation as to what is therapy, what is a person there for, what is the overall goal, um, and, and then creating those expectations in, in partnership with the person you serve uh, works very well in all of our services that we provide here. Um, shifting the paradigm to a wellness approach is a more successful, uh, is, is much more successful with the peer advocacy and education because of the mutuality, because of the lived experience of people being there. Um, and we've really, um, again, it's, it's, it's now spilled over into other counties and it's growing for us. And we're actually designing a whole integrated approach as we move into health homes of providing even better services that are not just the traditional uh, peer services that people always talk about, outreach and engagement. It's more than that. It's really about recovery and better quality of life for people. So that's where it's, uh, we've, we've just learned so much from that, and that's where we're going with it. So with that, I am done, and I will pass this down to Kara, and thank you very much for listening. So I think, uh, Steve? Hello? Hello? Bobby? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Uh, I think well, we can Edie, open up. Uh, uh, Kara, this is Edie. Kara appears to be muted. Maybe she's having some technical difficulties. So I see there's a question from the group. Maybe I'll jump in and ask it. It's to hey, any. Steve. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm so sorry. I was muted. I'm so sorry. Hi, thank you so much. I was talking the entire time and nobody heard me, but thanks for being here, Harvey, Ellen, and Steve especially. Thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Thank you so much for your words of wisdom. Uh, we at CTAC are in full support and encouraging all all the use of peer partners in clinical services, and, and we thank you for sharing with us today. We did have one question that came in when you were talking, Harvey, um, wondering if you could answer it. It said uh, someone, Cindy, asked, from what I understand, WAM trainings for peer coaches cost $10,000. Are there any funds available to pay for this service? You know, I, I do think that you can get Larry Fricks to come and present on the topic probably for free because that's federally financed. But that's like a one-day um, or a workshop or an opening presentation. But I do I do think that really training people intensively. I think it's a two-day training to teach people how to do the eight-week WAM training program, and I think it does cost money. Again, as in the environments we're heading into, the payers of, you know, we, you know should, uh, seems to me to be anyway, it seems anyway to me to be a good investment for a payer to um, either across an agency or a health home or what have you to, to invest in that. It's... Uh, the money will, you know, the savings will be uh, multiple in that. Thank you. But and it's then not free. Sort, of, sort of around the same topic is a question from Pat who says, I'm still not clear on how to fund a peer group or peer support. How to fund a peer support group? Yes. Or, peer, or well, the use of peers, it sounds like. That's what they're asking. Well, let me, I'll say a word or two, and I'm sure my friends will say even better ones. But, you know, peer, there's peer support meetings that actually are not funded or often outside a program or maybe on a program site, but are really uh, voluntary and are not clinical or treatment groups. Uh, then there's peer skills training, which is financed through a program, uh, in my mind anyway. And um, so anyway, I would make that distinction. Uh, Steve or Ellen, you got yeah. If, uh, what I what I can say is uh, we we did get county funds um, for this peer support, and then we also uh, now have recovery centers in New York um, that help to fund some of the work we're doing. Um, but what was recognized in other counties was the value of the peers, and some of the counties have actually funded some of our services through their own county legislation, um, which has helped. Um, and, and Ellen, I think, can talk a little bit about the, the, the Medicaid piece of it. Yeah, I, I do think that within New York State, anyway, at this point, there there is a possibility of getting some 
uh, funds for non-billable services. There also is, once we move to the managed care, the Medicaid in New York, this is something that we're going to go to the payers for as, as a service provider and say, look, this is a non-Medicaid billable service, but you know and we know that the use of this is going to be show up in the outcomes, that it's very beneficial for people to move on. So in essence, it'll cost you less in the long run if we use these services. The, the insurer, you know, and the payer on this has that capability. So that's something you would talk with them about and try to uh, maneuver that way. Yes, there's the, the county piece. And again, it's it's a type of thing where if the if the clinic is being is billing and is doing the job of getting people into, and I can only relate to pros at this point, but into uh, employment or intensive uh, goal acquisition and those kind of things with people, their in, their revenue is going to be raised, and th that'll be due to the the peers possibly, you know, that are, that are providing those services. So if you're the revenue raises, then you need to, or increases, you need to take some of that and pay for the peers who are going to bring you more revenue down the road. Thank you, Ellen and Stephen Harvey. I have one more question I think we have time for. Um, this is from Adam. I'm wondering if you can share some specifics of any experiences in which the peer traditional provider collaboration didn't go so smoothly, what problems were encountered, and how were they negotiated? I know that, Steve, you spoke about some of the challenges um, around yeah. this. I don't know if you want to take it from there and if anybody else would like to chime in. Yeah, again, the challenges were, were the stigma and the fear of having peers in the clinic, mostly the liability, the information sharing, the, you know, the uh, confidentiality. And we had to do training around um, a lot of discussion around performance-based. You know, it's not behavioral-based jobs. These are performance-based jobs. We have expectations of our staff, and we have expectations of the clinic. The, the thing that helped us, even though it was still a challenge, was the leadership of the clinics were supportive of it. Um, but right now we're working in an environment where there is a, a clinic that is, you know, the leadership is not quite in support of it. They're still questioning, um, you know, the, the value and, and what we're doing. Um, so it's it's that, again, a constant, it's the communication is key and important. And also really discussing it from performance based of what we're trying to do, what is our mission, are we on the same page as, you know, with our mission, and to understand that there are going to be bumps in the road. However, there's going to be a lot of successes if we stay focused. I also think, too, that um, but some of the problems that we encountered at the very beginning around peers being involved in the clinical meeting. And some of the real medical model clinicians had a real issue over that because they felt, you know, we're talking clinical here. We're not talking rehabilitation. And that's a very key issue that we need to address with our staff is that the clinical and the rehabilitation are going hand in hand. There has to be a, you know, a two-way street there if we're really going to help people recover. So at first it was very bumpy. There was a lot of tension. There was a lot of, um, you know, kind of um, unconscious battling going on. Um, so we really had to, this is why it's important to have the the, super, the ultimate supervisor or the, the executive director or somebody from administration to be at that meeting just to sit back and make sure this is happening the way it, we want it to. And, um, you know, we really, and the other thing was, you know, when, when some of the peer staff started to, we, we noticed a shift in their thinking, that they became, started to become more co-opted, you know, kind of thing. So we needed to talk with them about the reason we hired them was for their lived experience, for, for the, you know, not to be there just to push medication and treatment, but to speak and advocate for that individual in the way that works with their recovery. So... You know, it's it, you know the, they may tell the peer 
that the medication they're taking really gets in the way of their relationship with their girlfriend. But they don't say that to the doctor. But the peer can say that to the doctor, and it's information. Um, this way, you know, the peer is advocating for the doctor to make some other adjustments and to really look into this issue with this person. So we don't want to lose that by people getting co-opted. So it's really incumbent on the this, this administration to stay on top of the mission control kind of deal and make sure that people's strengths that they're hired for are being played out. It is rocky. It does get rocky. But we haven't lost anyone yet, so it's doing okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. Thank you so much for that, and, and Steve and Harvey. Again, we really appreciate you giving your time and your expertise and, and all of your insight uh, to us today. I just wanted to run through just, uh, resources. So more so than any of our webinars, we have collected a bunch of resources for everyone today, um, and those, will be avail those slides will be available by the end of the day, and you can uh, access these resources. They're mostly websites, and a few are from Harvey Slides. And then just upcoming CTAC events in July, uh, July 17th from 12 to 1, we're going to have a webinar on suicide prevention with Aruna Jaw. And then in September and October, we're going to have webinars around substance use. Thank you again for participating with us today and being here. If you have any questions, here's the contact information for Harvey, Ellen, and Steve. And is it okay if people contact you guys if they have further questions and concerns? Sure. Absolutely. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. We hope you have a wonderful day, and we'll see you next month. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody.